So welcome to OS 10 Automation. Um, my name is Ben Waldy, and uh, let me clear up something first. This is one session, uh, two and a half hour session with 15 minute break in between. So uh, if you think that it's two sessions, the same thing over again, uh, you're mistaken. Um, but anything that I uh, go over today, I'll be posting download links to, so like any scripts and workflows and things like that, you guys can uh, download if you can't make it to the second session. Uh, I know there's a security, popular security session going on uh, at 10.45. Um, okay, so today we're going to talk about automation in OS X. Um, and as some of you may know, many of you may know, there's lots of ways to automate things in OS X. Uh, lo lots of applications have built-in automation features. Um, the Adobe applications, aside from deployment, apparently. I don't deploy the Adobe apps, but apparently that's not uh, very automatic. Um, but they do have, uh, like Il Illustrator and Photoshop, uh, have actions built into them. So your users are probably, or may, be, may, may or may not be automating some aspects of these, of these apps. Um, and so basically with Adobe Actions, you can actually just like click a record button, go do manual stuff, and then uh, come back and play it back. Um, iPhoto and Aperture and, and other apps allow you to maybe batch resize photos uh, or manipulate photos in some way. Uh, Mail and Outlook allow you to trigger scripts from rules, uh, or they allow you to process messages from rules as well. Um, and so there's lots of ways you can automate stuff in OS X. Um, so I would encourage you to explore the automation features in the different apps uh, that you guys use or your users use and uh, see what you can do with them. Um, today we're going to be talking about three main automation technologies in OS X. Uh, Automator, Services, and AppleScript. And um, the way this is going to kind of work out is probably uh, the first session, or the first part of the session will focus mainly on Automator and Services. Um, and then if I have time, I'll start on AppleScript. If not, AppleScript will start the second session. And then um, continue till we're done. Uh, if we have time, I will try to touch on some GUI automation in OS X, um, as well as talk about some of the security changes in Mountain Lion that may affect automation. Everybody hear me? This thing doesn't seem that loud, but maybe it's just me. Um, okay, so uh, let's see. So we'll, we're going to walk through creating automator workflows and services and Apple scripts, um, but I have a pretty good uh, number of demos and examples to show you guys. So uh, if it starts taking a while, then I'll just maybe open some and show you and walk through what they do. Um, so you can follow along. Uh, we're not going to really use anything that you probably don't already have on your operating system. Uh, Apple Script Editor, Automator. Um, there might be a couple things that you might not have, uh, but you can you know take the the stuff back with you and, and play with it. Um, and you're not going to learn Apple Script in in two and a half hours or an hour. Uh, you're not going to learn Automator. Uh, so I'm hoping to just kind of show you a little bit about what's possible, and then you guys can go back and maybe uh, translate that to what you guys do or what your users do. Um, also, I don't do a lot of uh, deployment kind of stuff. So everything I show you is kind of just going to be application-level automation. It's not really uh, deployment kind of thing. Um, but you can translate some of that to what you guys are doing uh, if that's the kind of stuff you want to automate. Um, okay. So, first I just want to mention the benefits of automation. So, there's a lot of benefits to automation, Apple Script, Automator, whatever. Um, first of all, a script or a workflow can do things way faster than a, a person can do them. Um, and it, it can make fewer mistakes. So, if you write your script or build your workflow correctly, it's going to do the same thing every time you run it. And you're not going to have to worry about, you know, clicking the wrong thing or typing the name wrong or something like that. So, it can uh, allow you to get more consistent and accurate results. Um, and for companies that are making products like maybe catalogs or brochures or something like that, they're automating that, they can generate higher quality products. Um, also, it can allow their users to have more time to focus on other stuff. I mean, everybody's busy, and nobody wants to be doing the same repetitive stuff all, all day, every day. Um, so uh, it can give you time back in your day. And I know a lot of users and people, uh, when they start hearing about automation, it's like, oh, I can automate that. Um, they kind of feel a little bit nervous for job security. Um, but honestly, it just gives you more time to focus on other stuff. Everybody's got more work than you can handle anyway. So, All right, so let's talk about Automator. Um, 
All right, so what is Automator? Automator is an application installed in your uh, applications folder. It is a user tool, designed to be a user tool to help make automation more approachable to the user, despite how difficult Automator is to use. <laughs> uh, that was Apple's intention, was to create a, a user-level tool. Um, and it it's kind of a little bit complicated to learn, or it seems complicated to learn, and probably nobody ever really uses it. Uh, but if you sit down and play around with it a little bit, it, it is not that hard to use. Once you figure out the basics of it, um, after an hour or two, you can probably automate some basic stuff on your Mac. Um, it was released with Tiger, and um, it was it had a pretty major upgrade with 10.5, uh, and then it hasn't really been updated a whole lot since then. Um, it's still around. I don't know what the future of it is. Um, Apple still up, you know, they did update it for Mountain Lion a little bit. Um, but, you know, who knows where it's going. Um, I haven't heard anything or anything. I'm just, uh, people always ask me where, you know, what about Automator? It never gets updated. <laughs> um, also with sandboxing and things like that, I, I don't know how that's going to affect stuff with, with Automator. Um, but anyway, it is, it is still around and it is good for doing some basic automation stuff. Um, it's designed to automate time consuming and repetitive things you do on your Mac. Uh, and you don't have to be a scripter or programmer to use it. Um, so basically, in Automator, you have what are called actions, and each action is a pre-built uh, feature, pre-built automated function that does something. Maybe it creates an email, or it um, makes a file on the desktop or a folder somewhere. Um, and you piece these actions together, uh, kind of like ingredients, to form an, a workflow, which would be like a recipe. Um, and then you can run that workflow to perform you know, those tasks whenever you want to do them. Um, so a lot of Automator workflows are, are very you know, simple, just maybe like one or two actions. Um, but people do build, you know, pretty complex workloads. Um, but overall, uh, they're, they're generally pretty simple. Um, Automator, it's, it's really a tool that brings the power of multi-application automation to the user level. So, um, instead of like, like the, I mentioned the Adobe apps and actions in Adobe, um, they're great. You know, if you want to automate stuff in Photoshop, sure, go record an action and you can play it back. Um, but if you want to integrate Photoshop with something else, uh, Photoshop Actions can't do that. They can't talk to other applications outside of Photoshop. And same with Illustrator Actions, can't talk outside of Illustrator. Um, so Automator allows apps to talk together. Um, and so you can create these workflows that, that do this kind of stuff. Um, and like I said, with a little bit of practice, everybody can, can do it. Um, Automator comes with probably a few hundred Automator Actions to do things with Apple's apps, like mail, address book, um, the calendar, um, what else? The Finder, uh, things like that, some system stuff. Uh, there are also lots of third-party actions that you can get. Um, I've released some in the Mac App Store. There's other actions you can download. You can just go online and find them and download them um, for all different apps and uh, processes. Uh, and a lot of third-party apps also support Automator. So um, if you download an app, uh, let's see, like Pixelmator from the Mac App Store has Automator actions, or uh, Transmit or Fetch uh, have Automator actions. So these actions are built, generally, they're built into the application. So when you install an app that has Automator actions, they just show up in Automator. Um, so if you install Transmit, you'll just get the Transmit actions. Um, some action, or some applications like Microsoft Office, uh, save, they, they save the actions into, uh, the library Automator folder. Um, so, and I actually wrote the actions for Office, for Microsoft. So, uh, despite my, I think, rec I probably recommended that they put them in the app, but uh, they didn't. <laughs> um, anyway, so the point is, as you add more actions, or more applications to your system, you get more Automator actions. Uh, but not every application supports Automator. Um, what's Automator good for? Well, for doing simple things. Um, you're not going to build a big, complex uh, Automator workflow. And I get emails from people who are trying all the time, and they're constantly running into problems. Um, it's not really designed for that. It's designed for just like, you know, you want to do one or two little things real quick. Uh, maybe you want to zip up a file and attach it to an email. Uh, things like that. Um, but you can do, you can build, you know, complicated workflows. Uh, you just will start running into limitations. Um, so batch processing files, uh, it's great for doing things with images because it has a lot of image manipulation actions built in. Um, uh, you can do stuff with iTunes, uh, your photos, and all kinds of stuff. Uh, renaming files, things like that. Um, you can also add custom functions to applications. So Automator workflows, when you build a workflow, there's all different ways you can save it. You can save it as an application, 
And then when you click it, it just runs like any other app. Um, you can also drag files onto it and have them get processed. Uh, you can save it as a, as a folder action and attach it to a folder. So when you drop stuff into the folder, it, it automatically gets processed. Um, you can save it as a print workflow. So it shows up in your PDF drop down in the print window. And then you can, uh, you can print a PDF and have that PDF get processed by the workflow. Um, so when you start integrating it with these kinds of things, then it starts getting more useful. You can do more stuff with it. Um, and I, I, I've created automated workflows I use all the time, like from the PDF button and things like that. Um, also services, you can create services with Automator, which we'll talk about as well. Um, Automator's not good for complex stuff. Um, you're not going to do probably a catalog automation project with Automator. You're not going to build, you know, a whole deployment system with Automator. Um, it has a lot of limitations. Uh, it, it's not good at analyzing things and taking different courses of action. So it can't, say, look at a folder and decide, you know, if this file's here, do this. If that file's here, do that. Um, so as far as the limitations of Automator, um, there's limited actions available. So you're, you're limited. It takes time to build Automator actions. And um, each action is basically almost like a little app. So, you know, to create hundreds of actions takes a pretty significant amount of time. Um, so there's limit, limited number available. You're limited to whatever actions some developer has decided to create that they think you might find useful. Um, and they're not always well maintained. So um, even you'll find probably some of Apple's actions in Automator may be broken. Um, and, you know, it's just... Maybe probably they didn't get a chance to test every single action, uh, or they didn't test them in every scenario that you might encounter when you're using them in a live situation. Um, actions also don't always fit together. Uh, when you build uh, an automator workflow, they pass information between them. Um, and so sometimes that information doesn't work, like the actions don't match up. And so you might run into situations where you know, you're, you're doing something with, with data, and then you want to do something else with it, but the action that cross, that, that's next in the workflow, it doesn't handle that type of data. Um, so you can run into limitations like that. Uh, Automator, it's not good at looping. Uh, it has a loop action, so you can loop a workflow over and over again. But uh, most people want to do things like, you know, loop through a bunch of files and process the files. Um, and it doesn't do that. There's some workarounds for that, which we'll try to get to. Um, but, but anyway, it has limited looping. Um, it doesn't have any kind of branching logic. So you can't, build, like I said, you can't build a workflow that looks at a situation and takes different courses of action based on that. Um, and there's not really any good workarounds for that. I mean, there's some kind of hacky things you can do, but, uh, but overall, it, you, you can't really do that kind of stuff. Um, and it, it's not always intuitive. So like I said, you know, it's designed to be this, this tool that anybody can use, like just, oh, just open it and you'll start automating stuff and saving tons of time. Um, but it doesn't really come across that, that way. Um, services. Okay, so, whoa, I have a number up there. Okay. Services are, and you probably use some of these yourself, they're automation features or options that are in the operating system. Um, in, in an app, if you go to the application menu, you have a services menu. Um, or if you control click or right click on something in certain applications, like let's say you select some text and text edit and right click on it, you can see a services menu. Um, with Automator, you can create workflows that show up in these menus. Um, and this is actually a pretty powerful thing. Um, because you can you can create a workflow that processes the data that you have selected. Um, so you could create maybe a file service that whenever you right click on a file, it you know you choose that service and it does something to process the file. Maybe it, it changes the name of the file or copies the file somewhere. Um, you can create services to manipulate images, um, and you can create services to process text, which I use a lot. Um, and we'll we'll create some services for this kind of stuff. Um, services. Uh, allow applications to kind of share their functionality across the operating system with other apps. Uh, so you see services for like, oh, you know, Evernote might have a service for, you know, add this file to Evernote, um, or, you know, OmniFocus might have a service for take the selected text and put a, uh, put a, a task in my OmniFocus. Um, so that's what services are. And you don't have to uh, write any code or scripting to use them. They're just built, built in, although you can create your own now. Um, just as far as no scripting and coding goes, you can actually, uh, if you want to get, you know, more complicated in Automator, you can actually write Apple scripts and shell scripts and things like that and build them into your workflows as well. Um, okay, Apple script. Apple script also built into OS X. Everybody has it. Um, and like Automator, it's used to control your existing applications and to automate time-consuming and repetitive things that you might do. 
Um, AppleScript, it's very verbose, uh, so a lot of developers don't like it. Um, I was not a developer. I went to school for fine arts, uh, and I was a graphic designer. Um, and so I actually found it very easy to pick up because it was very visual to me and easy to, to follow. Um, but it's relatively easy to learn in comparison to other languages. If you sit down and try to learn like Objective-C or something like that, it's, it's pretty complicated and it's going to take you a while to get through it. Uh, if you sit down and try to learn AppleScript, uh, you can pick up some basics in an hour or two. Um, you know, it'll take, still take you time to get up to speed. Um, but it has a very English-like syntax, uh, although that kind of depends a little bit. Um, but if you open up a script, uh, a lot of times you can tell what that script's going to do just by looking at it and walking through it. I mean, anybody can tell what this code is going to do. Um, so it's it's fairly easy to pick up for people, um, and it's fairly approachable. Uh, but it, it can some people don't like it just because it's it's really verbose. Um, like Automator, uh, you can expand application features with AppleScript. Uh, some applications actually have uh, AppleScript attachability. So InDesign, for example, um, you can actually attach AppleScript to InDesign so that um, you can add menu items to InDesign. You can uh, set up scripts to run when certain events occur. Um, so I have a script that I wrote for a client that um, when InDesign launches, it, it automatically creates new menus. And when they select those menus, then scripts run. Um, but I also have scripts that run like when they save a document or when they print a document or something like that um, to, to do something. Um, so so that adds a lot of power. And there's there's not a whole lot of apps that allow you to attach scripts, um, but there are there are some like that. Um, and other other apps allow you to maybe run scripts as from from within them, like FileMaker, for example. You can you can run an Apple script, uh, either an external script, or you can embed it in your FileMaker database. Um, so that allows you to do some things uh, beyond maybe what FileMaker's built-in scripting can do. Uh, you can also include interfaces with your Apple scripts. Um, so most people, when they build an uh, an Apple script, they just double click it and it runs, and then um, you don't really see anything happen other than whatever the result of the script is. Uh, maybe you have a few little dialog boxes or something that appear. Um, but overall, it, Apple scripts don't have a lot of uh, user interface uh, feedback. Um, but you can build complicated user interfaces with Apple script, um, but it just takes time to do. Um, I actually have a session tomorrow if anybody's interested in that uh, on Apple script Objective C. It's, it's a lot more advanced. Um, but to show you some of the kinds of things you can do with building interfaces, you can really make an app that looks just like any other app uh, in OS X. Um, and Apple Script's good for doing simple things, um, but it's also great for doing really complex stuff because you can have uh, that branching logic and stuff that you can't have with Automator. Um, things that Apple Script can do, batch processing. So maybe you have a script that you want to convert um, that you wrote that you want to convert a bunch of files, like a whole folder of files, or even a whole folder structure. Maybe it, the script loops through the folder structure and looks for files, um, and then does something with them. Um, database publishing. Uh, I've done a ton of stuff for clients where they have maybe data in FileMaker or, or another database, uh, and they, they want to have AppleScript take that information and place it in InDesign and format it for them and things like that. Um, so it allows them to build their documents very quickly. Um, image manipulation and conversion. Um, you can you know, write a script that processes stuff in Photoshop uh, or with a background application in OS X. Uh, file and folder maintenance, even just things like, you know, changing file names, batch going in and getting a list of file names and, you know, putting them into a document or, uh, or change, adding a prefix to files all over the place, um, things like that. So there's a ton of stuff you can do. Um, a couple of notes on AppleScript and application. Uh, so in order to script an, Apple, an application, that application has to support AppleScript kind of like an application has to have automator actions available to control with, with automator. Um, not every application is Apple scriptable. Not every Apple application is Apple scriptable. Uh, but most of the ones you use on a daily basis probably are scriptable or have some level of scripting support. Um, the level of scripting support varies from application to application. So you might have one app that has tons of support and one app that has no support or very little support. Um, again, using Adobe as an example. Uh, Photoshop, InDesign, Illustrator all have very extensive Apple Script support, so you can automate a ton of stuff uh, in those apps that you would do manually. Uh, Acrobat, not as much. You can you can automate something. Uh, Acrobat supports JavaScript more than Apple Script, um, and that's just the the uh, the Acrobat team decided that that was what they wanted to support more because it was a cross-platform thing. But you can have Apple Script call JavaScript in Acrobat, uh, so you can get around some of these these things. 
Um, another thing to keep in mind too, if you write scripts, uh, and you're, especially if you're deploying them to people, that Apple script, uh, could break if you upgrade an app that that Apple script interacts with. Uh, that's because the developer may change the terminology that the script uses. Uh, Apple scripts, you know, they compile, they, they, they're compiled at runtime, uh, so when you run it, it looks at the app to see what the terminology is. So if you upgrade, say, Photoshop, and Adobe's changed some language, your script might not work. Um, in general, most applications uh, provide backward compatibility pretty well. And um, in my experience, especially with like Adobe and, and things like that, um, if you do have problems, it's pretty minor stuff that you have to fix. Uh, it just might be a couple couple things here and there. Um, Microsoft Office did change their Apple Scope support pretty significantly. I believe it was when they went to Office 2004. Um, so a lot of people had scripts that had to get updated and fixed. Um, but since then, it's been pretty much the same. Um, if an application is Apple scriptable, it will have what's called an Apple Script dictionary. And you can open that in Apple Script Editor. We'll take a look at that. Um, and that will show you all the terminology that application understands. Uh, dictionaries are kind of a little bit uh, confusing and difficult to figure out and understand how to navigate, um, but that's where you find all the Apple Script terminology. Uh, some apps or some developers provide documentation as well on their scripting. Adobe has very extensive documentation on scripting. Uh, they have Adobe's apps for the most part support uh, Apple Script and JavaScript, and they have very very extensive documentation on both online. They also have scripting forms that you can go to and find answers and post questions uh, and things like that. And I think they might even have some example code and things like that that you can download. Um, so just keep in mind that, you know, what you're scripting kind of depends on the application, and you might run into some limitations here and there. Um, but in my experience, there's workarounds most of the time. I've found very little, very few things I can't automate, um, either directly with Apple Script or using some kind of workaround. Okay, so let's take a look at Automator. Um, so in your applications folder, you should have Automator. And... Um, Let's see here. Just want to go out to my uh, switch my iPad to my example, so I make sure I go through everything. Um, okay, so um, so we're going to start by creating just a simple automated workflow. But I want to walk through the interface first, just so you kind of understand it. Um, so when you first launch Automator, you get this template selection window, and here's where you choose all the different kinds of workflow that you want to create. Um, personally, I find this a little bit confusing um, because it doesn't really well. In my opinion, it doesn't behave the way I would expect it to, to behave. I would, I would probably want to save, choose the type of workflow I'm creating maybe once I go to save it. Um, but that's not the way it works. So you choose your type of workflow up front. Mm -hmm. um, a little bit, uh, so if you create like a workflow or an application, you can, ch you can, when you save it, you can save it back, you can save it the other way if you want to. Um, if you create like an application, you want to change it to a service. Um, you have to do like file duplicate, so it's a little bit um, it's a little bit different, uh, and that's what I find kind of confusing. But it seems like that's kind of Apple's changed that throughout the operating system anyway. So, all right, so you choose the type of workflow you want to create. Um, you have a workflow, which is just like a basic file, like a document. You double click it, and it opens in Automator. Um, some applications and processes can run workflow files, um, but in general, you're probably not going to be creating workflow files very often. Um, an application, you double click it, it runs, you drag files on, it's automatically drag and droppable. So you drag and drop files onto it, they get passed to the workflow as input and passed to the first action in the workflow. Um, service can be used to process uh, selected text in an application, uh, selected files. It's contextual, so um, there, you, you could set it to like only process image files, uh, or only show up when you're in the finder, uh, or only process text when you're in mail. Uh, or only process uh, URLs that are selected. So things like that. So it has, that actually gives it pretty pretty good amount of power uh, for doing some neat stuff. Um, a print plugin shows up in the PDF services menu. If you go to the print menu and you have the PDF button at the bottom, it'll show up there. Uh, and it'll, it'll take the PDF that you save. So it still saves the PDF into like a temporary folder. And then it passes it to the workflow for processing. So you can do all kinds of cool stuff with that. Folder action. You attach it to a folder. When you drop something in that folder, it picks it up and processes it. Um, there's some limitations with that. Uh, if you have a folder action workflow, um, you don't want to probably copy or save a file or write a file into the folder. 
because automators sometimes, just folder actions in general, have a knack for picking up stuff before it's done writing. And so that can be a problem if you're going to process something. Uh, so ideally, you would want to save it somewhere and then move it into the folder. Um, and, uh, so, so that's one issue. Another issue with folder actions is um, a workflow may be processing a file, and new files arrive in the folder. Now, it's supposed to pick them up, but it doesn't always happen. So the folder actions are a little bit buggy, um, and I don't tend to use them very often. Um, calendar alarm. So a workflow that you can run from an iCal for a calendar alert. Um, and that's uh, actually in Mountain Lion. You used to be able to run an Apple script from a calendar alert. No longer in Mountain Lion, um, probably due to sandboxing. So uh, you can still run an automator workflow from a calendar alarm, and you could have that trigger an Apple script. So that's the workaround. So when you create a calendar alarm, it actually creates a, a calendar, an automator calendar in uh, in the calendars app, and then you can, uh, and it automatically attaches the workflow, so you can schedule it to run. Um, an image capture plugin, which I've never ever created um, myself for anything, and I've never heard of anybody really creating, but you have the image capture application, which I guess some photographers use to download their photos, and um, if you create an image capture plugin, you're supposed to be able to trigger it from image capture. Uh, and it will process files as you download them from your camera. Um, I, I played around with that recently, and I had some hard time getting it to work, so uh, I don't even know if that works. All right, so let's create a simple workflow. So um, so I'm going to select Workflow, and you guys can follow along. You should all have Automator. Um, I think I mentioned this in the beginning, but everything I walk through, and probably more than I'll walk through, will, I'm going to give you guys a download link that you can download the complete package of everything, take it home, play around with it. Um, I have links to different websites and things that I mentioned in there, um, and my slides are in there as well. Uh, that stuff will all be posted, I believe, alongside the YouTube video as well. Um, so, But I'll give you guys a download link if you want to get to it sooner, because I don't know how long the YouTube uh, thing will take to get up. All right, so uh, let's say you want to create a folder on the desktop uh, that's, that's named with the current date. Um, so here on the uh, left-hand side of Automator, this is your action library. Uh, actions are organized into categories, um, and you can create like smart groups, which I don't know if anybody ever does that. I've never had to do it. Um, but they're organized into categories. Um, I very rarely click through these. I usually just search for something. Um, so if I want to search for folder or something like that, or new folder. Um, you can also, if you go to the uh, view menu, you can arrange your actions by application. I prefer them to be arranged that way, because then I can see what, what actions I have for different applications. Um, but when you search, it doesn't just search the application name either. Applications can, or actions can have uh, keywords and things in them. So, um, so just be, you know, if you don't know the name of an action, you can just try searching for what you think it might be, and you might still find it. Um, uh, let's see. So just a couple other things uh, just to cover some interface stuff. Um, you have a description. So when you select an action, uh, you see a description down at the bottom. This tells you... Uh, Usually very little information about the action, um, but it sometimes, in some cases, it'll give you a little bit uh, of good information. Um, it also tells you uh, input and result. So the input, that's the kind of information that the action takes uh, or that it receives as input. So actions can receive input from another action. Um, uh, and then they can, then they have a result. They can pass a result to another action. Um, and so this tells you that this action, for example, activate fonts, which I, I've never used, but um, it expects as input font book typeface, and its result is font book typeface. So this action would have to be preceded by some action that outputs font ty book typeface. Um, so let's look uh, at folder. So new folder. So here, this action, um, which you might actually use, uh, this action, ex it looks for files and folders as input, and it tells you that if they're passed to this action as input, they get copied into the folder. So um, so that might be useful to you. Uh, you can you can also some actions will allow you to ignore their input. So in this action, you know you might have something that's processing files first, and then you create the folder, and you don't want the files to get copied into the folder. You can have the action ignore its input, so it just creates the folder, it doesn't copy anything into it, um, and then it outputs files and folders, which really is just it's the folder that it just created. Um, so to create a workflow, just drag or double click uh, the action, drag it to the workflow. And you see you have an interface. Um, so I will just call, I'll just enter uh, a name, my folder. And um, if I run it, 
you can see it creates a folder on the desktop. If I run it again, the, this action is smart enough to know there's already a folder there called My Folder. I'm not going to create it again. Um, you can see you have the little green check mark down at the bottom. That tells you the action ran successfully. Uh, if it doesn't run successfully, then you're going to get a red X and you might get an error. Um, Automator has a little log at the bottom. Uh, if you click this little tiny icon down here uh, or choose View Log, that will show you uh, kind of what the workflow is doing. Um, so it tells you what actions run. And um, if there's any incompatibility between actions, like this action didn't get the right kind of input uh, or some error occurred or something like that, uh, it will tell you that kind of information. And at Automator a Workflow, it can have it like a showstopper error that just stops the workflow, or it can have an error that's handled, like it just ignores it. Um, so suppose I wanted to add the, uh, the date to this. Um, let's see, so there's an action called Rename Finder Items. And if I drag that to the workflow, uh, first thing Automator does is it tells me this action is going to modify your files in some way. Um, and it suggests that you add a copy action first. Um, so uh, most of the time when Automator is going to do something that's irreversible, it will alert you and it will suggest that you do something like back up the stuff you're going to modify first. Um, in this case, it's just a folder that we're creating, so it doesn't really matter. Um, if I say add, it's going to add a copy finder items action before the rename. Um, and I don't want that, so I'll just say don't add. Uh, and you can, there you saw there's a checkbox, you can disable that, um, that alert from coming up all the time if you want to. Um, so this action actually allows you to, to do all kinds of renaming. Um, but in this case, we're just going to add the date or time. So we'll say we'll add the current date. And for the format, I like to name things uh, year, month, day for sorting purposes. Um, and we'll put it before the name. And we'll use a dash and another dash. Uh, and leading zeros, and you can see it gives you a little preview down here of what the uh, what the name will be. Um, so now, if I run this, I get the um, I get the, the date appended to the folder. Um, and I think if I run this again, I'm probably going to get an error. Uh, actually, so this this action was smart enough to not cause like a showstopper error, but it did give the warning that um, it can't name something because the name conflicts with something else. Um, Also, um, when you look at the actions, at the bottom of the actions, you have a couple different tabs. So description, that just shows you what appears here. So whatever the description area on the left-hand side, that's showing you what you have selected in the action uh, library. But you, know, you might have another action selected in the workflow area. Uh, so you can view that action's description if you want to. Uh, you can collapse an action, uh, because if you start building an, a workflow with like a whole bunch of actions, it might get you know, kind of long to look at, and you don't want to have to keep scrolling through it. Um, you can view options. Uh, here's where you can choose to ignore the action's input if you want to. And uh, this could be disabled. Not every action will allow you to ignore its input. Um, you can also set it to show when the workflow runs. Uh, so maybe I want the user to be able to change this folder name every time the workflow runs. So if I select that and I run this, now it, when the workflow runs, it allows me to type in the folder name and choose, choose the output. Um, you can also choose like which items you want to show up. Um, and let's see. Uh, Oh, you can also disable actions. So maybe you have like a big long workflow and one action's not working, you want to disable it. Um, you can just right click on it and say disable, um, or you can do it from the action menu as well. Um, you can also step through a workflow, which is good for troubleshooting. Um, so you can just go through one action at a time, make sure it's doing what it's supposed to be doing. Um, you can also view the results of an action. So again, each action has, uh, has a result. Uh, so if I run this, and then I go view the results, you can see, okay, here's the result of this action. It's the, the my folder on the desktop. Um, so that's a good way to troubleshoot your workflows and make sure they're doing what you expect them to do. Um, let's see, what time is the break? I just want to make sure I have enough time. 10.30? Okay. Yeah, okay. Oh, yeah. There you go. <laughs> uh, okay. All right, so that's um, so that's the kind of the basics of how Automator works. Um, all right, so let's create uh, another workflow. Uh, let's see here. So I'm just going to delete these, uh, or you can just create a new workflow. Um, suppose you want to create a workflow that creates a contact sheet of photos and attaches it to an email. Um, so I'm going to create a workflow, and um, if you search for Ask, you can find there's an action called Ask for Photos, uh, and you can choose a 
you know, enter a prompt if you want to and allow multiple. Uh, and then um, the next thing I want to do is create a contact sheet of photos. There's actually a contact sheet action. So if I just search for contact sheet, if I can spell it right. So there's a new PDF contact sheet action. And I'll drag that to my workflow. And I'll just call it contact sheet. Are you guys seeing this stuff? Oh, you don't have ask for photos? iPhoto's not on there? OK. All right, so if that's the case, how about ask for finder items? All right, so ask for finder items. And um, we'll change the prompt to choose some images. And you can choose uh, files, right? And um, since a user might choose something other than an image, um, there's actually a filter action, filter finder items action. And we'll drag that in, in between. Um, and we'll say, OK, search uh, only filter for files that are of kind is image. So that'll filter out anything that's not an image. Um, so I did ask for finder items, right? So that so when I run this, this is going to ask me to choose some files, uh, and I and I chose uh, I wrote a prompt to choose some image files. But you can see I can choose anything, right? It's not actually this action doesn't it allows me to choose files or folders. It doesn't allow me to choose images. Um, so that's why I was going to use the ask for photos action because uh, that only allows you to choose iPhoto act or stuff that would appear in your media library. Um, but I guess you guys don't have that, so uh, so we can do it this way. Anyway, so ask for finder items, at, choose some images, filter finder items for anything that is an image, and then build a contact sheet of those images. Um, and you can choose some different options here. Uh, I'll just create it on the desktop. And then uh, maybe I want to create an email with that contact sheet attached. So I will search for mail, and there's an action called new mail message. I'll just double click on that. And um, you can specify a subject. You could um, have the email send. You know, there's a send action if you wanted to. Uh, I'm not going to do that. I will just put in my email address. And here are some cool photos. So you can see that um, this action links up to the action before it. So the, the new mail message action in the description, it says that this action accepts files as input. So if, it, if a file gets passed, it automatically gets appended as an attachment to the mail message. Um, you, you can't pass, uh, oh, actually, I guess you can pass text, and it gets appended to the message, supposedly. Um, but, but files get attached to the file, or to the email. Um, all right, so is everybody following along on that one? Oh, okay. Well, you can just still just create the contact sheet on the desktop. Yep. So the FileMaker actions, those are that's an action pack that I developed and released in the Mac App Store. Um, so when you install that, you automatically get the actions, but they don't come with FileMaker. Uh, FileMaker did release some actions at one point, um, but I think they just stopped supporting them. I, I don't even know if you can still find them. Um, but other applications like Aperture, for example, you install Aperture, you will just see these actions. Uh, Adobe, the only action Adobe gives you is save as Adobe PDF um, for Acrobat. Um, but there's other actions like that yeah, you can get third-party ones. Um, ARD, I believe. I'm not sure if they come with ARD. There's a lot of actions for it, uh, or if you have to download them separately. Uh, but if, I think if you go to the ARD website, they have a section on automated actions. Um, I've never really used them because I, I don't get a lot of requests for that, helping people with that kind of stuff. Um, but there are a lot of ARD actions, which I would imagine you guys would find useful. Um, OK, so let's see. So I'm going to just run this, and I'll just go into resources. I have some example images. And if I select these, Uh, hello. Let's 
you can see, uh, basically, it created a PDF and it attached it to my email of my selected images. Um, so that's just, you know, just an example of something you can do. Right, exactly. There, uh, Microsoft Office does have uh, Outlook actions as well, which you could use, uh, potentially do the same thing. Um, yeah, yeah. So if I say if I did not say allow multiple selections, then it would only allow me to select one. I can't I can't select more than one. Um, so you know every action is different. The behavior is going to be different. Some actions you know might might have everything you need. Other actions might not. Um, okay. So let's uh, let's create an application workflow uh, that also processes uh, photos. So this one, I'm going to create an application. And you can see the top of the workflow now says, this application receives files and folders as input. Now, a lot of times when people create like a, an application workflow or a folder action or a service or something like that that processes files, they, they, for, they start it by adding an action like get selected finder items or get specified finder items or something like that. Um, you don't have to do that because the files get passed to the workflow as input. So if you add another action like that, it ends up pulling your files. Like it, it will process the same files twice potentially, uh, because it's, you're getting the selected files and appending them to what's being passed as input, um, which is the same file. Uh, so, so, so one solution is to just make sure that you're not doing that. Um, so this ac application receives files and folders. Uh, so we want to um, filter again for image files. So I'm going to filter for anything that's kind is an image. Um, and then the next thing I'm going to do is create a new folder. So I don't really want to uh, modify my original file. So I'm going, to, I'm going to create a duplicate of them in another folder. Um, so we'll call this uh, converted images. And again, this action will copy anything that it receives as input into it. So I don't need to add like a copy action or anything like that. I'm just going to clean up some of this stuff on my desktop. Um, so these files will automatically get copied into the folder. Um, so the next thing I'm going to do is, so the output of this is a folder, right? But we want to process files again. So, uh, so now what I have to do is get the contents of the folder. So there's an action called get folder contents. And this is another issue that, that people run into a lot is, you know, they, they pass files to a folder and then they create the folder and they expect the files to get passed as output. But th this action doesn't pass files as output, it passes the folder. So you have to then get the contents of the folder. Uh, and you can choose to have it repeat through subfolders if you want to. Um, and then the next thing I want to do is convert these to sepia tone. So um, there's an action called, uh, I'm just going to search for quartz uh, or filter, I guess. There's an action called apply quartz filter, apply quartz composition filter to image files. You can see they came up with a really, you know, descriptive name for that. <laughs> um, but here you have all kinds of filters you can choose uh, for, for doing things. You know, if you want to create like a matrix style uh, image, you can do that. Um, I'm just going to choose sepia tone. Um, and some of the uh, choices have options here as well. Um, I said don't add because we're already working with a copy. So basically when I added this, it asked if I wanted to uh, copy the files first. Well, this action already copies the files. So we're already working with a duplicate of the original. Um, okay, so I'm going to save this and I'll just call it uh, convert to sepia. And I'll just save it to the desktop. And here's where you have... Um, I mentioned you could only convert certain types of files or certain types of workflows. Uh, so here it's by default set to save as an application. If I decided now I want to save it as a workflow, I could change that. Um, but I'm going to save it as an application to the desktop. And uh, I'm just going to go out of Automator. And here I have uh, my images again. And if I just drag them onto this application, you can see they get uh, processed, or they should get processed. And you can see they've all been converted. Um, 
So this, this is something that I use actually pretty frequently um, for doing things like putting screenshots in documentation. Um, maybe I don't want my screenshots to be all, you know, full screen size. Uh, or um, if I'm writing an article or something like that or a blog post, uh, I a lot of times have to convert images to different formats um, or different sizes and things like that. So I, I use that fairly frequently, that kind of stuff. Okay, um, next up I want to mention uh, variables. So Automator has uh, variables as well. Um, so if I create a, a workflow, um, a variable is basically a chunk of information that's determined at runtime. So uh, for example, we created a workflow that created a dated folder before on the desktop. And so we did that by, by creating the folder and then adding the date to the folder. But we could actually do that at the time we create the folder as well using a variable. Um, so there's all different variables that are included with Automator. Um, the the date, date variables, location variables, like different folders, um, because you, you might be uh, having a workflow. Maybe you have a workflow you're distributing to users, and that workflow puts something in a certain spot, uh, but you don't necessarily know what their home folder is called or something like that. Um, so you have these kind of dynamic variables, like uh, the user's directory or the user library folder or whatever. Uh, and you can also create your own uh, variables as well. Uh, you also have system variables, like... Um, you know, the IP address or the operating system version. So you can use variables to get some, a little bit of information. Maybe you want uh, an email that, or an automated workflow that's going to send you an email that generates some information. Um, actually, one, one thing that I think might be useful is, uh, you know, a little workflow or something that, that gathers information that you can just have your user run and, and it will email you, you know, information about their system. Um, or log files or something like that uh, so that you don't have to walk them through going to locate those. Um, you can create text variables uh, and then user variables as well. Uh, and then also some, you can actually have Apple script code and shell script code run from a variable if you wanted to. Uh, I've never really done that. but um, So we're going to use uh, one, one of these variables. Um, so I'm going to go back to library, and or act, the action library, and I'm going to create another new folder. And uh, there is actually a new dated folder action, but that, that didn't used to exist. Um, but, so we're going to do this ourselves. Uh, so I'm going to create a new folder on the desktop, and um, just call it my folder again, or dash my folder. And now we want to add the date before that. Um, so if I go back to the variables area, uh, and I go to date and time, I can say add today's date, and I can just drag it over to this field. Um, so with this, this won't work with every text field in every action. Some actions will allow you to set... Uh, variables into their text fields, and some may not. It depends on how the action was built. Um, also, path pop-ups like this will uh, usually allow you to uh, use variables as well. So if I wanted to save this into the, uh, well, it's saving to the desktop. Maybe I want to save it to the documents folder. I could drag this over here and use that as well. Um, uh, under the date and time, today's date. Um, so... Now if I, let's see here, if I double click on the variable, you can see here's the format that it's going to name things. And you probably, probably don't want slashes in your folder name. Um, in fact, you might get an error if you try to run this. Um, so you can choose a, a different format for the name, um, but what I like to do is go to custom format. And if you go to this, uh, you have all different kinds of options. So uh, you know I like to have my dates in, in year, month, day format. So I'm going to drag the year up to this field, and then I'm going to say, okay, I want a four-digit year and I'll do a dash, and then I want a, the month, and I'll just say I want a two-digit month, and then another dash, and then I want, uh, oh, that, that was the day, sorry. I'll drag the month up there. I want a two-digit month, and then the day. Um, and sometimes these things don't, like I changed this to uh, to two digits, but it didn't, didn't update, it doesn't update until you click out of the field. Everybody get there? Yep, double-click today's date and then choose uh, from the drop-down custom format. Um, okay, so so some actions will allow you to configure them and some will not. Uh, I believe the if it's blue, it lets you configure it uh, with a custom format, and if it's not, then it then it doesn't. Um, so now if I run this, uh, I'm going to change this back to the desktop just so we can see what it's doing. 
um, if I run this, you can see now it does the same thing that the other workflow did, but it does it in one step instead of two. Um, so, so that can be pretty useful as well. Um, another thing that you can do with variables uh, is you can store information uh, at maybe one point in your workflow and refer back to it later. Uh, so that's useful as well because automators don't have branching logic and and because automator workflows run in sequence. So when you run a workflow, it uh, it takes information, it passes it down from one action to the next. But you know, once you've processed or once you've moved, kind of moved on, you might need to get back to that information you were using in the beginning of the workflow. Um, so in the actions area, there is, if you search for variable, you can see there's two actions, uh, get var value of variable and set value of variable. Uh, so let's say you create a folder and then you want to save a reference to that for later use. Uh, you can insert the set value of variable action and then uh, create a variable kind of on the fly for that folder. And then later on, you can use get value variable to get it again when you need it. Um, so let's see here. So I'm going to build onto this uh, workflow. And let's see. I'm going to create a workflow that cleans my desktop up. Because um, I'm sure, you know, I know everybody has a clean desktop, but, uh, but we'll do this anyway just for fun. So, all right, so I'm going to create a folder called Today's Date, and we'll call it uh, Desktop Files. And I'm going to create this, since I'm cleaning up the desktop, I want to create it somewhere else, like my Documents folder, which would never be a mess. So, um, and so now what I want to do is I want to store a reference to this, uh, to this folder. So I'm going to insert uh, set value of variable, and I'm going to create a new variable that I will call uh, folder or output folder. Everybody got it so far? Um, okay. The next thing I want to do is, hmm? I'm sorry. Okay. All right. So, so I'm I'm creating a folder and then I'm storing a reference to that folder uh, in a variable called output folder. Uh, the next thing I want to do is I want to get the desktop so I can get anything on the desktop and clean it up. So um, one way I could do that is I could say get specified finder items, and I could choose the desktop. Um, or I could use a variable. So um, actually, if I go back to my variables area under locations, uh, let's see. I don't think they actually have one for desktop. So I'm just going to drag a path variable to my uh, workflow. And if I double click on it, let's see. If I double click on it down here in the variables area, I can say desktop. And I will name it desktop. So. Um, in the actions library, I click variables, locations, path, and then I just drug it to the workflow. And then um, if, you, if, if you don't have this area down at the bottom, if you click this little button, it will show up. Um, this shows you all the variables in your workflow. So next to the log button. Um, and, then, and then here, I just chose what I want for my variable. So I want the desktop. And I renamed it from path to desktop. Um, okay, now this action links up to the previous action, which I don't want to do. So I don't want to append the output folder to the desktop. I, I just want to get the value of the desktop, and that's it. So I'm going to, from the action menu, let's see, I'm going to click the action, and I'm going to say, oh, not disable, <laughs> ignore input. So that kind of breaks the link, right? So this action now doesn't get anything as input. So all it's going to output is the desktop. Um, all right, so the next thing I want to do is get the contents of the desktop, any, any files on the desktop. So if I go to, back to the Actions library and I search for um, folder, I guess, um, and I find the Get Folder Contents action and drag that to the workflow, um, I can, I'm now going to get anything that's on the desktop. And then the last thing I want to do is move all that stuff to the new folder I created. So if I just search for move, there's a move finder items action. And if I drag that to my workflow, I can choose um, where I want the files to move to. And in this case, from the little variables area at the bottom, I'm just going to drag output folder 
up to that pop-up. Um, so if in all right, so let me let me walk through this. All right, so first I'm creating a new folder. I'm appending the date, a date variable to that folder. I'm creating in documents. Then this folder gets passed into this action, which creates a variable that holds that folder. Um, well, this this I just chose new variable. Okay, to create the output folder variable, I just chose new variable. Um, if you just in actions, if you just search for variable, you'll find the action. Um, next, I I drag get value of variable over to uh, to the action or to the workflow, and I went to the variables area under locations, and I found path variable, and I drag it to to this pop up. Actually, I think I just drag the. If you drag just a variable here, it adds a get value variable action. So I don't think I actually drug that itself. Then I set this action to ignore its input so it doesn't take anything and append it to the desktop. I then double clicked on the path variable down here in my variables list and I renamed it desktop and I mapped it to my desktop folder. So I could map it anywhere I want to but I want to clean the desktop up so that's what I mapped it to. Then I got the contents of the folder which is the contents of the de anything on the desktop and then I moved it to the output folder. So if I run, and if you are having trouble following along, this is, you can download the workflow. Um, so if I run this, you can see it cleans up the desktop, and if I just go to my documents folder, and my documents folder is a mess, that's right. Um, it's because I keep moving, uh, cleaning up my desktop to it. So. Um, but there's all my stuff, so it got moved to this folder, um, and I'm just going to move it back. So there you go. Um, so as you can see, you know, it's a simp it's a simple thing we want to do, um, but Automator it, it's not as user friendly as you might expect it to be. I mean, you you have to kind of build each step of what you want to do. Um, it's a good idea to to kind of outline what the steps that you want to perform, um, and then build your workflow kind of around the outline. Um, and and when I say outline, I mean like outline like every little step. You know, create folder, name folder. Do this, do that, um, because that's how Automator works. It does one single thing at a time. Um, and you have to kind of figure out how the information gets passed between actions. Um, so you can see, like, this workflow would not have been possible without variables either. Like, there's no way I would have been able to create, well, no, no easy way I would have been able to create a folder in the documents folder, then get the, um, then get the contents of the desktop, then move it to the documents folder. Like you have to use variables if you want to start building a little bit more involved workflows like this. Um, so, all right, so that's variables. Um, I am running very short on time. So how about I, uh, I'm just gonna show you a few workflows and then we'll talk about services very quickly because uh, I've only got 17 minutes left. All right, so, um, Workflows, and again, all these things, I'm giving you guys links to download them. So, Automator doesn't have uh, InDesign actions built in. Um, this is a pack that I released, but I, I, and I'm not like trying to sell my InDesign actions to you, but I just wanted to show you an example of something somebody might want to do with looping. Um, so, Automator has an action called loop in there. And if I look for it um, and add it to my workflow, you can see it doesn't really do anything, it just loops. Um, and, and you can ask it to continue or you can loop automatically and stop after a certain amount of times or minutes. Um, but people don't really want to do this. Like, why would you, in most cases, why would you want to just run a workflow over and over and over again? Um, you know, unless you, I don't know, maybe you want to get information and then wait like a, a minute or two and then get more information and wait another minute or two and get more information. But most people really want to process files or something like that. Like, they want to loop through a folder of files and do something. Um, and one of the problems with that is, like, let's say you have a folder of InDesign files and want to convert them to PDF. Well, if you just create an automator workflow that gets all the InDesign files and then converts them to PDF, well, each action, like, that information passes through the workflow in one chunk. So the first action gets a folder, let's say, 100 InDesign documents, and then it passes them to an action that opens them in InDesign. Well, it's going to open all 100 documents. And, and you don't really want to do that. You want to process one document at a time. So... Um, so 
Automator doesn't have an action built in to allow you to loop through files. Um, there's actually a third party action called dispense items, dispense disk items incrementally that this allows you to get around this problem. Um, so basically this action receives a bunch of files as input. And then at the end of the workflow you put the loop action. And this, this action, every time it loops, it just releases one, like whatever the next file is in the list. Um, so I'm just going to open up a workflow that, that kind of demonstrates what this does. Um, so I have, uh, here I have a bunch of InDesign documents. Uh, there's nothing special about them. They're just you know, pretty much blank documents. Um, and then here I have a workflow. It will open. Okay, so let me just quickly walk through what this does. So the first action gets, uh, it gets specified finder items. So it's getting a folder of InDesign documents. Then the next action gets the contents of that folder. And then I have that dispense items incrementally action, which I've just kind of collapsed here. So that action, so I have three files in this folder. The first loop, it's going to pass down the first file. The next loop, the second file, and so on. Then I have an open documents and InDesign action an export documents to PDF action, and a closed documents action. You can see that, like, if I didn't do the dispense items incrementally, it would open, like, all three documents and then convert all three to PDF and then close all three, uh, which I probably don't want to do. Like here, um, if you go to action, ignore input, or right-click on the action and choose ignore input. Um, and then I have a loop action, which... I get under options. Uh, no, uh, yes. Sorry, that is also there as well. Um, yeah. So another limitation of the loop action: it doesn't allow you to loop unlimited. Like you can't just say loop until whenever. Uh, so here I just set it to loop for ten minutes, <laughs> uh, which is kind of another annoyance with that action. Uh, anyway, so if I run this, let's see. So it's opening up one document, and then it's saving it as PDF and closing it. And it opens up the next document, it saves it as PDF and closes it. And then it opens up the next document and does, it does the same thing. So I, I just have it saving to the desktop. Um, but you can see, and now it, this is, is telling me that it encountered an error. It's not actually an error. Uh, if I look down here in the workflow at the bottom, it just says, no disk items were passed or all items have been processed, basically. Um, so that's how that... That, that dispense items incrementally action, it's kind of uh, a little bit of a hack. Like, it, it, it causes an error to stop the workflow. Uh, no. No, you, can, you can't. And actually, you know, Automator, um, Automator displays, it either does, if you have like an app, Automator application and it encounters an error, it either doesn't display an error when it encounters one, it's just, there's no result. Or it displays a completely, you know, irrelevant error. It doesn't, doesn't mean anything. Um, so it's really hard to diagnose automator workflow problems uh, if you're running them outside of automator. It always goes back to the beginning of the workflow. You can't choose where. That's why, that's why we have the dispense items incrementally action. So that, this, Well, it, it stores, so the first time this action runs, it stores a reference to all three files. And then when it runs again, it knows that it's already processed one file. It's still, like, it remembers that it already processed one file. So it's, it, it, you're right, it is still receiving all three files as input again, but it's ignoring them. And it's just, pro it's just dropping the next one in the list. Yeah. I don't know if that, um, you could try that. I'm not sure if that field accepts a variable or not. I'd have to test it. Um, also, I don't, I mean, you'd have to probably write an Apple script for it. Yeah, I don't know if that would work, actually. <laughs> um, there's no action to get, like, the number of files in a folder. You'd have to write some code to do that or something. Yeah, um, actions are written in Xcode. Uh, there's actually a template for creating an you can create an AppleScript Objective-C action 
uh, or a shell script action, I believe. Um, but they're they're basically like Cocoa apps for actions. Um, okay, so folder actions. I'm just going to skip that. Uh, well, I'll just I'll show you a couple. I'm just going to like open explain what they do uh, so that when you look at the download. So folder this folder action workflow. Um, basically, you have a folder on your desktop. When you drag files, images into it, it converts them to black and white. We've already done kind of that a bunch of times, so I'm not going to actually run that uh, just because of time. Um, print plugin workflow. So uh, fetch and panic, or fetch and transmit both have actions. Uh, so suppose you wanted an, a, a, a print plugin. You wanted a workflow that every time you printed a document, it was going to upload it to an FTP server. Um, you could actually do that. So now this this has been saved as a print plugin. So when I double click it, it and if you guys you know when you download this stuff, it's gonna if you double click it's gonna ask you if you want to install it. If you install it, it's gonna save it, it's gonna automatically move it to the library user library uh PDF services menu or folder. Um or you can open it with automator. So I'll just do that uh for now. Um but oh this is for saving a dated PDF to the desktop. Sorry. There I have another one for uh, doing a PDF to panic or to uh, transmit. Um, the, the dated PDF to desktop, I actually use that a lot. Like anytime I create a proposal for a client or something like that, I always add the date to the beginning of it. Um, so I just have a PDF service that um, it moves the, because whenever you create a PDF uh, plugin, a print plugin workflow, it your PDF gets saved to a temporary folder. So the first thing you do is move it to the desktop, and then you add the date or time to it, and uh, and that's your you know, now you have, every time you print a PDF and you choose that, it automatically adds the date to the PDF. Um, here's the, um, the upload one. Very, very, very simple. Um, basically, I just created a favorite in Transmit, and then I chose uh, the favorite from my list, um, PDFs. It's just a folder on my FTP server. Um, and then, so this P receives the PDF files as input, so if I, uh, let's see, I'm going to install this. Install. And if I, suppose I want to uh, print this to, to my FTP server. If I go to File Print, and I choose this PDF to FTP server, you can see it opens up Transmit, and then it um, connects to my FTP server which I don't know if this is going to work, um, and then it uploads it. So one action now, I've created a, a workload that does that. I'm just going to cancel that. Um, no. I mean, you could run like a shell script or something to do it instead. Um, and then calendar alarm workflow. Uh, this workflow, actually, I'll just run it from here. Um, but this basically... The, the idea behind this was that you could set, uh, maybe you have a server, and every day you want it to email you a system profile for system information. Um, so there's a system profile action, and you can get uh, some text about the machine. Um, so here I have, like, hardware text, software text, and so forth. Um, and then I'm passing that to the new mail message action uh, with today's date and server report, uh, and then send outgoing messages. Uh, so if I just run this, you can see it just sent me an email. Uh, which is probably sitting in my outbox because I think I'm offline right now. Anyway, um, but that's basically what it does. Uh, and so if you create a calendar alarm workflow like this, it would actually attach it to an, a calendar event and then trigger when the, uh, when the event occurs. All right, so limited time. Uh, all right, so let me move on to services. So services uh, are also automated workflows. Um, so I came up with just a handful that I thought might be uh, useful to system admins. Uh, one is a script that, or a workflow for copying paths of selected items, uh, because users are always trying to tell me where things are, um, and so where they're trying to tell each other where things are. And uh, I have one client that every time they they want to, they're like, "Hey, go here and find this file on the server." They they like open up in column view the window as big as they can, and then they take a screenshot. They're like, "Here, go to this folder." This it takes forever to, to get to that path. So um, so you can actually just do that with Automator. So let me just open this workflow. Um, if you create a service, 
At the top of the service, it allows you to choose what kind of information that service processes and what application it processes in. So here, I've set this service to receive selected files or folders in the finder and then just copy the copy it to the clipboard, which just copies the path. So, um, so let me just uh, double click to install this. Oops. So I'm going to install that. And if I, let's see, I'll just create a folder. Well, I'll choose this one. So if I go down to the services menu now, right click and go to the services menu, copy paths of selected items. And then I'll just uh, maybe create a text edit document. And you can see it, it pastes in the path. Um, so it's a nice way to, uh, to get the path to something. Um, all right, so how about revealing the item, right? So here I've created a, a workflow. This time it processes selected text in any application. And, um, and I might want to, you know, do something to make sure that it's actually a path, because uh, if it's not a path, I might get an error or something like that. But, um, but this basically just the reveal finder items, it's smart enough to actually take a text path and convert it to like an actual path. Um, so let's see here. If I install this, actually, let me, um, I'm going to get this one instead. Or here, I'll get this path, because I'm going to install this and it's going to move it out of there. All right, so if I double click this and install, now if I go in text edit and I select this path and right click on it, you can see the reveal selected path shows up. And if I trigger that, it goes and select that folder. So, um, so let's say you know, a u users are sending back and forth files, file paths that are on a server share or something like that. Uh, this would be a very quick way to navigate to that. Uh, and that will work in mail. I don't think it will work in Outlook, though, because I'm not sure if Outlook uh, supports services. Um, here's another one. Um, three minutes. So, <laughs> uh, okay. So this one receives files and folders in the finder's input, and then it just adds the date or time to them. So um, that's another way you could... I, I use this kind of thing all the time as well, um, because, again, I always am adding the date to a folder um, or to something. So let's see, I'll just save this to my desktop as test, and I will open it and install. And if I just right click on this, um, here's my add date prefix, and you can see it adds a date prefix. Um, so again, just a little thing, but, but can be very useful. If you're typing the date, you know, on a file every time, first of all, I never know what the date is. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, but but I don't look there. <laughs> um, they just get installed into the uh, the user library services folder, so you can just move them out of there. Um, but you can also go into the keyboard system preference, and uh, here you can there's a services area under keyboard shortcuts, and you can actually like turn on and off services. So um, let's see. So here's files and folders. You know, I don't, I don't know that these are all in, like, alphabetical order the proper way, but um, it's kind of a hassle to go through all these. But you can see here's, um, here's a bunch of things. You can add keyboard shortcuts to them and things like that. Um, and I think if you uncheck these, it disables them. Uh, yes, but I believe you could put it, you could move it into the uh, library folder instead. Um, Here's another service uh, that um, this one does. Uh, it scales images. Again, this is one that one that I'll use this for like preparing blog images or something like that. Um, it takes images as input, image files, right? So it ser this service automatically filters for image files. So I don't need to insert that filter finder item. Then it copies them to a scaled images folder on the desktop or wherever, um, and then it scales them by a percentage uh, by percentage of 100. <laughs> Should probably be like 50 or something. Um, but you can scale by uh, by pixels or by percentage. Um, so that's you know that saves me a lot of time because anytime I want to scale stuff for a blog or something, I just you know I used to write for unofficial Apple Weblog, and every week they had a limit on like how wide stuff could be, and so I just set up a workflow that just you know I I build all my screenshots, 
and I just select them all, trigger the, the automator workflow, and it would just make a folder of all the scaled screenshots for me. And it would name them too. So it was like it would it would all name them all like however I wanted them named. Um, and the last one I just want to show you is uh, oh we're out of time. So all right, well happy birthday. <laughs> Anyway, there, there's an action for creating an image out of text, so that was basically what that was going to be. So, all right, so uh, thanks, and 15-minute uh, break, and then we'll start up on AppleScript.